All right. Simi, um, would you like to put the slides up, please? Awesome. OK. So welcome to Explore Entrepreneurship Idea to Product. This is uh, the first in our series of three webinars. Uh, today we'll be speaking about um, how to actually get started. Yeah, and a little bit about prototyping and, and how to use prototypes um, and what it means to take the first steps uh, when you have an idea. Next slide, please. All right, agenda for today. Um, we're gonna do a quick introduction of the session of us as the facilitators. Um, and we already did a little bit of an introduction of who's in the room. So this expedites the process. And then we'll jump into misconceptions about entrepreneurship and what the entrepreneurship process kind of looks like uh, that we know of, and then uh, talk about um, being in part of and how that relates to the entrepreneurship process. And then we'll jump into Q&A for anybody to ask us, ask us any questions and anybody in the room as well. Next slide, Simi. There we go. Um, so before we start, want to do a land acknowledgement. So we would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather uh, has been, and sorry, my Zoom window is kind of covering up the, the text there. Uh, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather has been and still is the traditional territory of several indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy, the Wendat, the Métis, of the Credit First Nation. Since time immemorial, numerous Indigenous nations and Indigenous peoples have lived and passed through this territory. We recognize this territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and the Two Row Wampum Treaty, which emphasizes the importance of joint stewardship, peace, and respectful relationships. Sheridan affirms it is our collective responsibility to honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here and those who have yet to come. We are grateful for the opportunity to be, to be working and living on this land. Um, and I want to recognize that, you know, this isn't just something that I'm reading. It's not just a block of text that I'm reading, but it, it's uh, a reminder that, you know, we and the land that we exist on are interconnected and that we must and respect it and respect the people who have uh, taken care of it um, before we were here. Next slide. All right, today's facilitator, Dan, would you like to do a quick introduction of yourself? Yeah, um, my name is Daniel Bushin. I'm from the city of Brampton, known as the hashtag business advisor. So you can always check me up on Instagram. Um, my main role at the city of Brampton Entrepreneur Center is to help startups and existing businesses grow, uh, help them start with their ideas, right down to how do I get to that 100 customer uh, baseline. Um, the Entrepreneur Center is here to help you, and we'll talk a little bit more about our services at the end of the presentation. Awesome. And, Thank you. and John, do you want to introduce yourself? Will do. All right. So um, my name is John, John Lamb, the startup man uh, from Sheridan College's Edge. So very similar to the Brampton Entrepreneur Center, we're here to help uh, entrepreneurs take their idea and um, turn it into reality, whether that is a business idea, a social enterprise idea. Um, we like to focus on, on impact here at Edge, um, but you're welcome to speak to... Dan, to me, anybody at Edge or the Brown Entrepreneurship Center, if you have an idea or if you have multiple ideas and you want to choose one to move forward with. Um, like Dan said, we will be talking a little bit more about the Brown Entrepreneur Center and Edge at the end of the presentation. What we want to do is really jump into the content to make sure that um, you are here to get what you're here to get. Next slide, please. All right, take it away, Simi.
Hi everyone, I'm Simi. I'm the Administrative Specialist with EDGE and I'll be helping with some backend. So just before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few Zoom rules, which I'm sure you've all heard before. So please keep yourself muted while you are not speaking so that we can avoid any background noise and ensure we can hear the speaker clearly. Also feel free to turn on your camera. It's not required, but we love seeing everybody's faces. And if you have any questions or comments throughout the content, please feel free to write in the chat, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen and as you can see in the slide. Also, please remember we'll be recording this session. So please only say things that you're comfortable sharing with everyone and you will be able to find the recording on our YouTube page afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so I'm going to get started. Um, quick couple of questions, and this is something just to simply reflect on. Um, if you have an answer, feel free to type it in the chat, but the intention of asking these questions is for you to have an answer in mind and to reflect upon it. So what do you think of immediately when you hear entrepreneurship? What do you think of immediately when you hear change making? How would you describe the process from generating ideas to running a company? All right, so take a couple of seconds and reflect upon that and you know, see what comes to mind when you ask yourself this question. Next slide, please. So common misconceptions, now that you've kind of gotten a, a rough idea of what your first impression might be, um, and you're able to reflect upon that, some common misconceptions that we hear about entrepreneurship on, on our end helping entrepreneurs. Um, the first one is that starting a business, an organization, a social enterprise, taking that first step to moving an idea along takes a lot misconception number one. Misconception number two is that entrepreneurs are creative visionaries. So people might think of um, visionaries like Steve Jobs, like um, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. All right, so misconception number two. Misconception number three is entrepreneurs have passion. And just by the sheer passion that they bring to move their idea along, they are able to bend reality and, and create the reality that they had set out to create just from the sheer power of will that stems from their passion. And then the last misconception is that, hey, businesses are evil. Businesses are here to make money and that's the sole purpose and nothing else matters. All right, so these are four common misconceptions that, that we hear. Um, what we do know, however, is that starting doesn't take a lot of money. And we're hoping that by the end of this session, by the end of the series of sessions that we have, you come to realize that, hey, look, there are a lot of free resources and that you yourself as a founder, you have sufficient resources to get started, to get the ball rolling so that you can then start to attract uh, money to continue the journey. But starting doesn't take a lot of money. Entrepreneurs are creative visionaries, probably not the case, right? Because the vision often has to change once it is, it is in touch with, with the market. So that's a misconception because people only see the success of the well-known entrepreneurs, but they don't see the failures and the struggles that have led up to what we see on a public side, right? So Creative visionaries at the tip of the iceberg, yes, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. Entrepreneurs have passion. Uh, the misconception here is that entrepreneurs are passionate about their idea. Entrepreneurs are in fact passionate about solving a problem, All right. So the passion about the idea to move an idea forward, that's not really the case. Uh, entrepreneurs work through problems to solve um, and, and to iterate on their intended solution, and they're willing to change to solve a particular problem. So passion isn't necessarily for the idea and the solution, it's more so for the problem. 
businesses uh, don't necessarily have to be evil. Do, are there evil businesses in the world? Yeah, we can probably point to a few, but is that the majority of businesses? No, right? Businesses exist to create value and they recapture value, right? But a lot of businesses, most businesses, I would argue, are not existing for the sole purpose of generating revenue at the expense of everything else. And we see things like social enterprises and impact uh, entrepreneurs who are balancing doing good in the world and generating revenue, using the revenue to do good and vice versa. So common misconceptions that we see, not entirely true, mostly untrue. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of the entrepreneurship process, here's what some people might think in terms of the entrepreneurship process. You have a great idea. You write a 20 to 30 page business plan. You take that to a bank or to an investor and they give you money to start. You start your business and you have a big launch party with all your family and friends with a red carpet and giant scissors that you cut a ribbon with. And then step number five, you sit back, run your business and watch the money roll in. So you may or may not agree with this process, but we have seen entrepreneurs who kind of have this type of mentality. And this is a myth and I'm gonna identify why these things hinge upon assumptions that are more likely to be untrue than they are likely to be true. Next slide, please. Assumption number one, you come up with a brilliant idea. Now the definition of brilliance, right? This is the, the assumption here for, for this to be true. The idea that you come up with in your own mind as a singular individual, for it to be brilliance, the chances are pretty slim because what defines a brilliant idea is something that solves a problem for other people or can be bought generates demand from other people. So if you're generating the idea solely by yourself as an individual without consulting your target market, without talking to potential customers, how do you actually know that it's brilliant? All right, so assumption number one, come up with a brilliant idea. We don't actually know if it's brilliant. Assumption number two, write a business plan, 20 to 30 page business plan. So, okay. Your, your brilliant idea probably, we're unsure whether it's brilliant. So now a business plan is meant to guide you through how to execute. So then the assumption there is that you know how to take the brilliant idea forward and that the steps that you have outlined are in fact true. But if we haven't talking to our, our customers, if we haven't identified whether the, the idea fits then how do we know the steps that we need to take to execute are actually true? So step number two, huge assumption there that it's hinging upon likely to be untrue. Next slide, please. Step number three, um, banks and investors are willing to pay you money for your 20 to 30 page business plan and your brilliant idea. So if the idea, we're unsure whether it's brilliant or not, and we're unsure whether the execution plan, the business plan is true or not, then why would an institution, why would somebody have money give you money to work on something that is unverified, that is based off of a lot of assumptions, right? So investors, banks, they're here to make money. Obviously, if, they, if they're giving you money, they need to see a return. And because you haven't talked to customers, because your execution plan and your business plan are unverified, what evidence do you have to bring to actually convince them to give you money? So step number three, unverified based on assumption. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, back one slide. Step number four, however, can be true. All you have to do is throw a party. You can get a red carpet. You can get a and you can get a big pair of scissors and cut ribbons all you want. So completely true, go ahead and do that. Nothing wrong with that, all right? However, um, if you go into step number five 
and you're sitting back, you're operating your business, and you're waiting for the money to come in, then that hinges upon an assumption. Right? So you're assuming the idea is brilliant, you're assuming your execution and business plan is correct, you're assuming you're going to get money up front. And if those things aren't true, then how are you going to sit back and just watch the money roll in? Which means under this entrepreneurship process, the only thing that you have that is for certain is you can throw a party for your family and friends, which is great, but you don't have a business or a social enterprise or a business organization. So that's a big myth about a, a traditional process of starting a business. Next slide, please. Now, how we see businesses actually being started um, is through a process of speaking to our customers to understand the problems that they're facing and to understand what solution we need to design with them, with the customer together in order to solve their problem so that they can gain value from having that solution and thus are willing to pay for that solution. So what we're talking about is problem solution fit, product market fit, and business model fit. What that means is a problem solution fit. You talk to the customers, you understand the problem that they're facing, you understand the pain points, and you design something that actually addresses those pain points. So that's problem solution fit. In terms of product market fit, we're talking about how the solution can be packaged into a product that can actually be purchased. At what price point? How will it be sold? Is it sold through retail? Are you selling online? Right? How do you meet your, your business and the customers? So the product matching with the market, you package the solution in a way that fits what potential customers, the market are willing to purchase and able to purchase. From there, the business model fit, right? So you actually sell, what are the components of your business? What's the infrastructure that you need to set up in order to capture the value that is created from the product market fit, All right? What are the things that you need to do on the back end to make sure that you are delivering that value and also recapturing the value in a monetary basis? Of course, under the traditional entrepreneurship process, what a lot of people see is potentially product market fit and business model fit, jumping into, you know, let's get a lot of money to register a business, to develop the product, and they kind of skip over that problem solution fit. So definitely important to speak to our customers to understand the pain points and the problems that they're facing. Next slide, please. All right. So I've talked enough. Over to you, Dan. Perfect. Thank you, John. Um, you can hear me well? Hello? Yes. Perfect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about generating and selecting and testing ideas. So one of the items is noticing the problem. Um, start with the areas you have expertise in. For example, if you run a uh, restaurant or build software, or renting apartments, teaching, writing, or et cetera. These are probably great areas to think about some of those problems. What, what exists in our industry or your industry? And then seeing if you can solve those problems. What problems are exist on the market that relates to my, my knowledge? Um, this is a great way to really utilize your own skill sets to um, solving some of those particular problems. Do I have a hobby uh, that I can utilize as a new business idea? Saw someone fall off a ladder, had a great idea. There must be a better way of doing this. Sometimes it's a random act that occurs and then you're like, there's gotta be a better way of doing that. Um, define the problem that you face on a consistent basis. List the top two to three problems you wish you didn't have. If it takes you more than five minutes to identify that problem or need, it's probably not a big one for you. Um, in regards to brainstorming ideas, write them all down. There's a tool called the mind map. Um, you can Google it and I, I would recommend utilizing this tool to help you uh, organize your ideas. And then once you 
start writing all your ideas, rank them. Rank them as the best idea that you are passionate about. Because to move a product or service forward, you have to be passionate about it. And then evaluate whether your idea solves the problem. Ask yourself, which of the following problem would you pay for right now if someone presented you with the exact solution? If the answer is none, your problem is not big or painful enough to build a solution for. Use a group of people to give you feedback. Create a survey. Talk to people about the idea. There's no sense of hiding the idea and, and trying to protect the idea. You need to speak to your customer base and your potential, your potential customer segments. Research the idea. See if it has been done before or, or if you can create a better solution. Look at Apple as an example. Apple didn't create the first cell phone, but they saw a problem within the ease of use of using a cell phone and created a product that really matches the demand that the customer wanted. Look at up the patent database. Google the keywords of your potential product. See what, what's available up there. Next slide, please, Sam. So here's a really awesome tool that I will, I always recommend when generating ideas to use. Uh, it's called the value proposition canvas. I'm gonna go through this canvas in quite a bit of detail, um, just because I think it's one of the most important, uh, important canvases when generating ideas. The, the value proposition canvas is intended to guide the development of products and services customers are lo really looking for. The value proposition canvas is about creating a fit or value between what you're selling and what your customer really wants. The value proposition helps to systematically understand what your customer wants and to create products and services that perfectly matches their needs. It's very important to understand that it perfectly matches their needs. Um, it, it collects customer information about their needs and requirements, which more, which allows a more effective design of your product. And that's why we're doing this three part series is to ensure that when you are designing, you're designing a effective product and ultimately your business model. Eventually, this should lead to sales and profitability in much less time and less time on wasted, wasted on developing the idea that customers would not be interested in. Anyone can think of a, of a good and creative business idea, but the business here is that, but the idea here is to design value for your customer on paper first. By using the value proposition canvas, you identify your customer's needs and products and services that meet those needs in a visual and structural way. So let's get on with it and let's talk a little bit about the value uh, proposition canvas. There are, uh, there are two main sections of the value proposition canvas, as you can see on the screen. The customer segment on the right and the value proposition on the left of the canvas. I always recommend you should start on focusing on the circle on the right, which represents your customer segment. The aim is to know as best as possible who is your customers, the habits, the real problems they have and the benefits they obtain when consuming your product. To do this, you should observe your customer and identify the points that answers the following. So let's start off on the customer jobs. So customer jobs refers to what a customer spe specific segment is trying to do or the problem they're trying to resolve. In other words, the regular activities they do to meet their needs. So questions that you may wanna answer yourself when filling out the customer job section is, what is your customer's activity? What social work do they succeed in doing? What emotion, emotions do they incite? What are their basic needs? Now let's look at the pain. The pain section, 
these are negative emotions, fears, or concerns that customers may experience before, during, or after doing an activity described in the job. For example, questions you may want to ask yourself. How long does it take them to do that particular activity? How much does it cost? Does it require a big effort? Do they find the activity tedious? What makes them feel bad when using the solution already available on the market? Think of the frustration, inconveniences, or concerns that would give them a headache. Which are the main difficulties and risks encountered by your customers when using the solution already on the market? For example, are there products, <clears throat> sorry, are there products with functionalities that do not provide performance and do not require, do not quite satisfy their requirements? Which, which errors do they tend to repeat, repeatedly commit when using that product? Which negative consequences do they fear? Which barriers do your customers encounter encountering when they adopt those solutions? For example, in initial investment cost, learning curve, or resistance to change. Now let's look at the gain section. The gain, the gain the customer obtains when performing the activities, including acquiring utility, earning positive emotions or cost savings. You should be asking yourself, what would your customer most likely save in terms of time, money, and effort? How do the current solution available on the market satisfy your customer's needs? For example, features, performance, quality. In addition, I would ask, what would make life easier for your customer? A flatter learning curve, more services, a lower price. Which results and expectation does your customer expect to obtain from the products and services? What are your customers looking for? A good design, guarantees, uh, special features? What, what would increase a segment's indication to adopt your solution? For example, lower costs, less investment, less risk, better quality, performance and design. And what criteria does your each customer segment takes into account when evaluating the success or failure of a particular product and solution? What social cons consequences are driven from the, from the use of your product or services desired by your customer? What do your customers dream about? Now we have looked at that section, let's now focus on the left side square to tackle the definition of value proposition. Each of the area squares should respond to one of the three areas that had been completed in the circle on the right, the customer segment area. So for identifying jobs, you need to define the features of your product or services should contain. The you need to look at the customer segment. So for identifying jobs, you should define the features your product and services should contain. The functionalities that will alleviate the pains and those that generated on the mentioned benefits. In this way, you will be designing a product on the basis of problems that are worth solving and not the other way around. We see this all the time in the Branch Entrepreneur Center. People fall in love with their ideas, but they're not solving problems in the marketplace. The value proposition side of the canvas distills the essential value of your products or services. The, the design process should include the following activities. Define the product and services that resolves the customer's job. Identify the medicine quotations. Uh, your product should mitigate your customer's pain. Mention the benefit your product and service will <clears throat> provide for your customer. In addition, when designing your product, you should consider the following aspects. Identify the functionalities the product and services should have to resolve the customer's work. Define the role you want your customers to have 
and how you can help them. Establish how your product or services help the customer be happier. Once you have reached this point in your development of your value proposition, there will be two types of hypothesis to validate. The customer hypothesis or the problem hypothesis. These are the assumptions of what we understand the customer problems are and the value hypothesis. These are the features and functions which our product should have to satisfy the needs of the customers. In other words, our value proposition. Once validating the hypothesis, you will be the pillar that underpins the foundation of your company. It is then that we can say that your startup has been valid, validated the problem solution fit, just like how John said. How do, how do these, sorry, how do the tests these hypotheses you ask? Get out of the building and ask. You can attain information about jobs, pains, and gains by entering into discussions with customers and observing the market by writing down the answers, categorizing, and setting priorities. A clear picture emerges of how to best serve your customer. As business owners, it is important to solve your customer's biggest pains. Once a hypothesis has been validated, it is time to move on to the stage of prototyping and business model canvas, which today we are just going to talk about prototyping. If you do want to learn about the business model canvas, we do both Edge and the Branch Entrepreneur Center has great workshops on the business model canvas. Uh, next slide, please. And so we'll talk about prototyping. A prototype is an early sample model or release of your product to create to test the concept or process. Typically, a prototype is used to evaluate a new design to improve the accuracy of the analysis and system of the user. It is the step between formalizing the evaluation and the idea. Prototypings often fail when tested and show the designer where the defects are and sends the team back to the drawing process to define or repeat the proposed solutions based on real user feedback. Because they fail early, prototyping can save lives, avoid wasted energy, time, and money, implementing weak or improper solutions. Another advantage of prototyping is um, it's very low in risk and the investment is usually small. Don't worry about failing. It's better to fail, but learn from those solutions. I'm gonna give an example of a client that I'm working with. So this individual, he's a contractor, he up and down a ladder on a daily basis. And a lot of times he needs a second person to hold the ladder. So what he was able to do was, he decided to prototype a stand for that particular ladder. He tried it out, tried it, uh, tried it out, created a pretty decent solution. However, when he gave it to his friends and colleagues in the construction industry, they gave him a lot of feedback saying, hey, it's not as stable as they expected, or the materials you're using is too heavy. Um, <clears throat> it's really difficult to set up. He took all the, that information and redesigned the prototype with all that customer's feedback and then was able to design another version. On the second version, he did the exact same thing, got customer feedback, understood some of the problems that they were facing still, started to ask about how much would they be willing to pay for the, a product like this? Um, and if the problem, if this product is really solving an issue, he, re he quickly realized all his contractors and colleagues really loved the product but his price point that he was thinking was a lot higher than what the market could bear. So he he came up with a third prototype and he created a cost-effective solution where he could meet the customer's demands, their needs, in addition to ensuring that the cost of the product was in line with what his customers demanded. Now, today, he's, he's pro 
he's actually piloting sales at the Brampton um, Home Hardware. It escapes me right now on what the uh, product name is, but as soon as I remember, I will bring it back up here. Um, and now we're going to watch a really awesome video. <clears throat> Simon, can you load the video? So in the interest of time, because we've had a couple of disruptions with the technology, we're actually going to skip this video, but it's good. Uh, this, this session will be sent out to you and the link for the video will be there. And I highly encourage you to, to watch this because, you know, it might seem like when we talk about prototypes, it might be very hardware and product focused. In the video, we talk about how software and how platforms and how services can actually be prototyped as well, because the idea with the prototype is to get something quick and dirty out there to then learn from your customers. So lots of value in this video, but I do want to make sure that we do have a couple minutes for um, the Q and A to make sure that we address any questions that you have. So we're going to skip this for the time being. Thanks, John. All right. So let's jump into the Q and A. Um, as you can see, if you don't want to turn on your video or unmute yourself and ask a question, you can use the chat. It's just, it should be on the bottom of your screen there. I will stop sharing the screen momentarily so you can see us as the facilitators. All right. So we talked about, you know, the, the misconceptions of the entrepreneurship process and how you can actually um, use the value proposition canvas as a tool, how to use prototypes to learn from your customers. Did any of this surprise anyone? Does this change any plans that you have in mind as you take your idea forward? Uh, yes, for me it did. Um, I come from a design background and, you know, I think the dream of every designer is design <laughs> first above everything else. That's why people want to become entrepreneurs because they're tired of working for businesses that don't put design first, but, but by focusing on a market and tailoring design needs for that market, it does make complete sense because you need somebody to buy it. Otherwise you're just throwing up some product out there and hoping somebody's going to find it as opposed to finding that target to begin with. So I found that particularly helpful as a person that is uh, sincerely focused on design issues. Not that um, uh, I can put that expertise to use, of course, but learning to put that uh, customer uh, first and finding the logic behind it, I think makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's a, a problem. Well, uh, thank you for your question and, <laughs> and your insight. Um, that's a problem that we see with a lot of entrepreneurs. A lot of times they develop an idea and go out to the market and wonder why no one's purchasing the product or not everyone is seeing the same vision uh, of the idea that they did. Right, and once once you put the customer first, and I, and I know that sounds cliche, but putting the customer first and the demands of the customers first, you will always design a product that meets those customers' needs. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Allison. I think you hit the nail on the head. Right, what's the purpose of design if? It doesn't actually increase usability or you know increase the people's actual experience of whatever it is that you're designing so yeah that is super critical we have about a minute left feel free to uh hop on the chat and ask us any questions and if we don't have time to get to it today we'll compile them and we'll answer them and we'll send it out in a follow-up email um, but for the last minute or so does anybody have any lingering questions or any comments that we can address very quickly? Scott, go for it. I see you've unmuted. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I did unmute. Um, I know we've only got a minute left. Uh, I come from a software background. I've been doing that for a long time. And 
I'm also interested in entrepreneurship. I've been in a couple of startups. Uh, Allison, you're right on the money. Um, you know, we see problems in the marketplace and we've got our solution hat on and we want to build something. <laughs> we want to solve that problem. And that's kind of, it is kind of backwards because you really need to validate uh, whether our approach, what we're thinking is something that other people resonate with and they're going to actually buy. I think the tricky part of this is flipping that around and, and trying to get that prototyping done first to validate your assumptions on, hey, I know how to solve this. I've got a great idea. Uh, so that's the tricky part. I know for me, I always struggle with that. I, would, I like building things. And often you pour a lot of effort, uh, time, perhaps money into solving something. And you don't really have that product market fit. So it's it's resisting that urge to build something and solve it before you know that other people like the way you've solved it. So quick question. I know we're talking about business model canvas. I've got some uh, knowledge about this area. There's also the lean canvas. And I wonder if, uh, if there are sessions on that uh, contrasting between the two, if there's one that you recommend over the other. So uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, the, the strength that I see with the Lean Canvas is that it accounts for the external environment, whereas the Business Model Canvas uh, is more descriptive about how you create, deliver, and recapture value. I think either one is going to be valuable because it's they're both quick and easy ways for you to list out your ideas, list out your assumptions, and start validating them. Because as you said, you know, like even building a prototype sometimes people can get caught in the build and perfecting it um, and not recognizing that it's a tool for learning. Um, whichever one you choose, whether it's the lean or the business model canvas, it's a tool that is intended for you to get out the door and start talking to customers as soon as possible once you've outlined your assumptions. So as long as you keep that in mind, you know, it's, it's really up to a preference for which one you choose to use. Yeah, and just to add, like the value model canvas that I just went over um, a few minutes ago is really a plug-in into the, either the business model canvas or the lean canvas. But a lot of times when individuals are looking at the value proposition, they're not taking account of what you said earlier in regards to building something for the customer's demand. And this is a great tool to help you really structure visually um, uh, how, how to create value uh, for your customer's needs. Absolutely. Um, okay, so I see that uh, Raj has a question in the chat. And Peter has responded with a couple of resources there. So definitely check them out. They look really interesting. It's not something that I've dug into, but just the name prototyping is really intriguing. So I'll definitely be taking a look at that. So um, thank you so much for being here. We have gone a little bit over time and I wanna thank you for you know, your, your patience um, with all the technical uh, issues that we've been experiencing today. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we will be sending out the slides to you in a follow-up email and um, this, this recording will be posted on our YouTube channel as well for you to review. For now, um, EDGE and the Brampton Entrepreneurship Center are both here to support your ideas. Uh, next week, we'll have Aaron Walker from the Brampton Library talking about uh, rapid prototyping and 3D printing. And then the week after, we'll have uh, Sal Jadawi from the Center for Manufacturing and Design Technologies here at Sheridan College to help you bridge the gap between prototyping um, and creating an actual product, working with manufacturers, and, and how to actually use the resources like applied research to move your idea along. So that's it for today. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Hope to see you at the next two sessions. Thank you. Have a great day, guys.